Uh, this is Bob Jaffe from MIT. Um, I'm chairing the second session. Uh, I've been interested in the Casimir effect for nearly 50 years, beginning with its role in the internal energy of hadrons in the MIT bag model in the 1970s. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers during the second session. Uh, one of the uh, interesting features about this session is that it shows the broad reach of the Casimir effect. The three talks we're having in this session really range over a very wide spectrum of applications of Casimir-like ideas. Uh, our first speaker is my colleague, Maron Kardar, who is the Francis Friedman Professor of Physics at MIT. Um, Maron is well known for his many contributions to, st to statistical mechanics in general. Um, to soft matter physics and to biophysics in particular, and for his two textbooks, uh, which are legendary among graduate students studying statistical physics. Um, I might mention that uh, Meron is particularly well known for the, his contributions to the KPZ equation, uh, which is uh, notable this year because the P in the KPZ equation refers to Giorgio Parisi, who is this year's Nobel laureate. Um, Maron, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you to talk about the near field propulsion forces from non -reciprocal, in non-reciprocal media. Uh, the, uh, Bob, thank you very much for the most kind introduction and also thanks to the two Davids for organizing this very nice meeting. Uh, so uh, uh, what I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, was initiated by a postdoctoral fellow at MIT, David Gelbwasser, who came to me and said, uh, well, I know some things about uh, quantum mechanics at uh, low temperatures. Can we uh, try to think about uh, making an engine based on the Casimir force? Okay, so if you uh, want uh, Cambridge, uh, an engine based on the Casimir force, let's think about the force first. Well, we all know that we have uh, uh, the force between parallel plates that was uh, proposed by uh, Casimir uh, 1948 and has since been experimentally verified in so some of the uh, brilliant talks that uh, we heard this morning being the refinements uh, uh, on top of the original uh, 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 experimental uh, demonstrations of this force. But the thing is that it is a normal force. And what we want to have is uh, two plates that are sliding with respect to each other. So rather than a normal force, what we need is a lateral force. Now, there are also examples of lateral Casimir forces, uh, things that uh, uh, Omar Mohyeddin, for example, experimentally measured uh, uh, many, many years ago between two corrugated plates. But this should really be regarded as an alignment force that tries to take two correlated pl plates and although it's a nor uh, lateral force, it's not a normal force, it really just brings them into alignment. And if they are in the configuration of uh, least energy of alignment, then the whole thing stops. And that's not exactly what we want. We want this force to cause uh, uh, uniform rotation or motion. So uh, in the other areas that I'm working on, like uh, soft matter and biophysics, there is a lot of work in converting fluctuations into a uh, uh, useful motion using ratchets. Uh, now, this is mostly fluctuations of particles, but here we have uh, for the Casimir force fluctuations of the electromagnetic field that are uh, quantum in origin. Can we somehow uh, uh, take advantage of these fluctuations and some kind of a, an asymmetry such as a ratchet uh, to cause uh, motion. Now, even in the thermal case, we know that this uh, is not going to happen in equilibrium. If I just uh, put this ratchet uh, in a gas of particles that are uh, impinging on it, although there is this asymmetry, there will not be motion because of uh, uh, thermal equilibrium except if you go to situations that are out of uh, equilibrium, you could uh, convert asymmetry to motion in this case because of the non-equilibrium motion of uh, bacteria that are impinging on this gear. So uh, 
uh, already Feynman in his uh, very brilliant discussion of uh, Ratchet and Paul uh, mentioned that one can sort of convert uh, these fluctuations into motion uh, by taking advantage of a temperature difference between the ratchet and uh, uh, the system that uh, is causing the fluctuations. Uh, so for example, you could uh, build a, uh, an engine that uh, moves something using these fluctuation forces with objects that are out of uh, thermal equilibrium. So we can certainly do that also for uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, field by having uh, thermal uh, uh, temperature differences between two bodies. And then there will be uh, out of equilibrium motion of uh, photons that are uh, bringing heat from one of the bodies to the other body. So maybe we can uh, combine heat transfer and asymmetry in order to cause uh, some kind of an energy. Now, uh, of course, uh, classically, the amount of uh, uh, heat transfer and uh, uh, the pressures that are caused by uh, uh, heat, uh, having an object that is radiating at some particular temperature are uh, stuff that we uh, teach at the undergraduate level uh, based on uh, essentially propagating photons and the uh, um, force and the momentum and the energy that they carry. And uh, based on these uh, uh, studies that we, uh, based on th things that we teach as an undergraduate uh, to our undergraduates, uh, uh, the pressure is uh, proportional to the fourth power of temperature of the body that is emitting uh, the photons, and the heat transfer is proportional to the uh, difference between the four uh, powers of the temperatures. Uh, now, of course, this Stefan Boltzmann law only works when you are thinking about propagating photons and the discussion that is appropriate when uh, the bodies are far apart from each other. And as is well known and experimentally demonstrated by uh, uh, our colleague Gang Chen at MIT, uh, things become much more interesting when you bring the two plates very close to each other and you have uh, effects from the near field and uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, evanescent pho uh, photons uh, tunneling energy from one object to another object, as a result of which uh, the, uh, as you approach to distances that are submicron, uh, the amount of heat transfer goes orders of magnitude larger than what is predicted by the Stefan Boltzmann law. Now, this is certainly something that was known earlier and was nicely experimentally demonstrated. Uh, the theoretical approach that uh, uh, gave, uh, can explain these results and also the results that we would like to uh, develop later on was uh, proposed by Ritov in 1959. And uh, basically uh, is, uh, based on some use of fluctuation dissipation uh, conditions. So uh, in uh, our sort of description of uh, Ritov's uh, fluctuational quantum electrodynamics, you are dealing with a bunch of objects that are individually held at some temperature. So there is a notion of local thermal equilibrium. Say this body is at temperature T1, this other one as T3, this other one at T2. And uh, what you want to know is to figure out uh, uh, both how much energy is transferred between these objects and also what kind of forces they exert uh, upon each other, which would be the generalizations of the Casimir force when we go out of equilibrium. So the prescription of uh, Ritov is as follows, that basically, uh, there are fluctuations in the electromagnetic field throughout, and the source of these fluctuations are currents that are residing on the bodies that are also fluctuating. The average of these currents is zero, but the fluctuations of these currents, their variance is controlled by, uh, uh, through the fluctuation dissipation theorem by the imaginary part of the response functions that you have in each body, 
and the magnitude or the strength of uh, those uh, fluctuations reflects on the one hand the zero point fluctuations and on the other hand the thermal fluctuations that are appropriate to the body that is uh, 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 that has these fluctuations in it so the temperature that one would put in this object this objects and the third object would all be different once you accept this formalism, then the rest of it is uh, uh, easy to say and hard to compute. The easy part is, okay, if you have a bunch of sources of ele electromagnetic field, these currents, then you can calculate the electric field that is generated by these sources at any point using a Green's function. And uh, uh, once you have the electric field, then you are in business because by looking at various correlators of the electro electromagnetic field, you can calculate both uh, the stress energy tensor and hence compute the forces. Also, you can compute the pointing vector and hence find the energy transfer. Now, of course, the hard part of this whole thing is to calculate partly the Green's function that is appropriate to this complicated geometry. Uh, uh, including the effects of the varying response functions that you have in these bodies. But in principle, that's a classical calculation. And once you have this classical Green's function, using this formalism, you can calculate the correlations of the electromagnetic field and convert it to the heat that is transferred between the two bodies. And hence, in principle, have an explanation of this experimental observation. Also, you can calculate the stress energy tensor and calculate the forces that are acting, let's say in this case, between two objects that are at different temperatures. And once you have a, a calculation of forces that are out of equilibrium, interesting things happen. Uh, for example, certainly the forces do not have to be equal and opposite. And in fact, uh, uh, for this system of uh, two silicon spheres, uh, there is a particular configuration and distance where the forces are equal, but point in the same direction. So in effect, the hotter object acts as a source of uh, uh, energy that pushes the cold object and the cold object through the Casimir force or the Van der Waals force pulls the red object uh, uh, behind it, and you have an example of uh, a kind of uh, rocket that is uh, constructed in this fashion. So the story of this part is that uh, our calculation of Joule is this rate of uh, uh, formalism and that near field effects uh, give rise to interesting modifications of uh, what we learn uh, in undergraduate physics. Now, Back to our story, we want to uh, uh, calculate a corresponding thing for uh, an uh, something that has the asymmetry of uh, uh, this uh, corrugated object. Uh, let's first start with the case of one object that is heated to some temperature T and see what it radiates. And what we find is that the heat that it radiates is given by a sort of standard formula. It is related to uh, uh, fluctuations uh, at various frequencies, uh, omega, and something that captures the scattering behavior of uh, this corrugated object. As was pointed out in the morning lectures, essentially mo morning seminars, the scattering formalism gives you really uh, the various geometric entities that we need to calculate, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, forces as well as the heat that is radiated. Now, associated with this uh, heat that is radiated, there is actually a transverse force potentially that is acting on this corrugated object. Because you have broken the symmetry between right and left, there could be a force that uh, is generated. And we found that the magnitude of that force has a very nice uh, relationship to the heat transfer. Essentially, where you had in your integral h bar omega to calculate the energy that leaves the objects, uh, you put an h bar k to calculate uh, the force that is experienced by the object. So it's kind of has the feel for essentially 
you're shooting away photons out of the system and these photons have energy h bar omega and uh, uh, momentum h bar k. Now, clearly, because of the uh, dispersion relation, uh, given some particular omega, your value of k is going to be limited and smaller than omega over c. And because of that, the magnitude of this transverse force has to be uh, smaller than the heat transfer divided by c. So that's just a very simple uh, results based on this. You don't need to know anything about the corrugation. So what we said, okay, but what is it? How big is this force that is uh, uh, in this direction? And when we calculated for the, pace, the case that we could actually calculate it, we got zero, which was kind of disappointing. I should say that we didn't do the calculation for the case of the corrugated shape that I'm showing you, but something that should be morally equivalent, that is um, a flat surface that was uh, uh, bounding a body, body that had an isotropy and the direction of an isotropy was tilted with respect to the surface so that the right-left symmetry was broken. Uh, unfortunately, this is the calculation that we could do and gave us a zero force. Uh, I'm still uh, not sure whether the, if we could do the calculation for the true ratchet, we would get zero force or not. I have uh, essentially a bet with my colleagues. I think it is zero and they are not sure that it is zero. The reason I think it is zero is because there is some nice work by uh, Shan Hui Fen and collaborators that shows that somehow the reciprocity of the electromagnetic field uh, imposes some constraints and actually using those constraints, we could have very easily shown that for this kind of uh, system, we would have had no force. But uh, also Shan Hui's Fen's work shows that we don't really need to do the calculation for the corrugation because there is an easier way to generate the asymmetry. And that's by putting a magnetic field on one of the bodies, which then essentially makes it non-reciprocal uh, and the response of it is described by uh, having uh, an asymmetric uh, but imaginary additions to your dielectric tensor. So once we did calculations with the non-reciprocal media, then we could generate a transverse force when there was a heat difference between the two objects. Now, the magnitude of this force, uh, we can actually get much larger also by bringing the two plates together. I told you that when we bring the two plates together, the heat transfer goes up dramatically because of the evanescent modes. It turns out that the force goes up even more dramatically. Essentially for each one of uh, your frequencies, the previous relationship that uh, F uh, C had to be less than H uh, is still a relationship between the force and the heat transfer associated with that frequency, except that you can replace the essentially at short distances in the near field regime, the speed of light with a characteristic speed that is obtained by using the distance between the two plates. So the near field effects become dramatically uh, uh, important and allow the force to get uh, larger and larger. And this is a kind of calculation that we can do, for example, for a, a plate that has uh, dielectric properties of silicon carbide and we put a magnetic field and uh, uh, the uh, curve that starts higher and then goes below is a measure of the heat that is transferred as a function of the separation and the other curve is actually a measure of the force as a function of separation. And we can see that as we get uh, uh, to uh, shorter distances, this ratio of force uh, divided by uh, Hc actually becomes larger than one. So we can have very large forces. Of course, the, uh, there is a very delicate dependence on the spectrum which frequency you look uh, at, which is a reflection of the uh, frequency response of the material that one uses. For the last uh, uh, piece of work, we are going to assume that the response of the material 
is focused at some frequency that I will call omega bar so that I can sort of simplify some of the calculations and write down some of the results. And uh, uh, essentially what I would like to do is to calculate what the efficiency of such an engine could be. Now there is a cardinal efficiency that you should not exceed, which is the difference between the temperatures divided by pH. I'm going to assume that the two temperatures are sufficiently close. It doesn't matter whether I put one temperature or the other in the denominator, just again to simplify things. Now, having a force does not give you uh, work. In order to get work out of this force, you have to move the plate. And once you move the plate, the power that you acquire is the product of a force times velocity. So you say, okay, the force times the velocity is the power, the heat that I use uh, is H, the efficiency is going to be the ratio of those two quantities. And well, that's almost correct, except that clearly it can't be fully correct because I can, in this expression, make V larger and larger and exceed the Carnot efficiency. And the reason that that's not allowed is because of, uh, uh, the nature of the calculation that I did has left out a number of things. One of them is the constraint that comes from Onsager relations. Af uh, after all, what I did was uh, I calculated the force at zero velocity. Onsager says that if uh, force can cause motion, then, uh, or heat transfer can cause motion, then motion can modify the heat transfer. And Onsager's relation tells us that if I start moving the plate at some velocity v, uh, the heat transfer is going to be different from what I had at zero velocity, and it allows me to calculate what that uh, correction should be. We actually explicitly checked that this was consistent with the uh, uh, Rito formalism. Um, the other thing that one has to consider is that uh, once you start moving, then you have frictional forces. You say, okay, let's uh, put nothing between these two plates. So we have just the uh, vacuum. Well, even in case of vacuum, you have friction. And this kind of friction was calculated uh, uh, by a number of uh, our colleagues. And uh, uh, there is a, a correction to the force that is reduction due to velocity that one can calculate. Now in the limit where everything is focused on a single frequency, we can uh, give values for all of these parameters. Uh, the, uh, actually for the case of the friction coefficient, uh, it is uh, simply proportional to H bar divided by the fourth power of the separation uh, the heat transfer one can calculate is proportional to h bar omega squared divided by the second power. And the force is going to be proportional to the third power, except that I had to put a factor alpha here. And this factor alpha is a dimensionless description of the effects of non-reciprocity through the magnetic field, et cetera. And it is this factor alpha that is material dependent and magnetic field dependent that ultimately determines the uh, efficiency of the engine. So putting all of these things together, uh, the uh, reduction in force due to friction, as well as the change in the heat using Onsager's relation, we get a formula for uh, what the efficiency should be and how it depends on uh, this asymmetry parameter alpha. Clearly at zero velocity, we are not getting any work out of the system. So the efficiency is zero. If we go to very high velocity, then we are working against friction and uh, there's lots of uh, losses to friction and the efficiency again is small. So uh, uh, there is an optimal velocity that gives you the maximum power. So that's called the, essentially uh, uh, the corresponding efficiency at maximum power we can calculate. And uh, 
is uh, related to this parameter alpha uh, that uh, determines uh, the, the degree of asymmetry, uh, how it is modified with respect to the optimal uh, 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 Carnot efficiency. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that again, once we go to this uh, uh, short distance regime in the near field regime, uh, the characteristic velocities are no longer set by the speed of light, but by this dimensionless combination that depends on the short, uh, on the separation as well as the appropriate frequency. And in principle, by going to small enough distances, uh, one can sort of work on uh, velocity scales that are quite reasonable in order to extract the optimal efficiency out of this engine. Okay, so basically to summarize, uh, to construct an engine, we need a force for which we are going to rely on Casimir force, not the normal force and not the lateral force that just brings things to alignment, but some kind of a ratchet force for which we need to go out of equilibrium. And uh, that would be the thing that would give us motion. Uh, then this motion and force is caused by heat transfer. So to compute the heat transfer, we uh, rely on the methodologies that are provided by uh, Ritov. And uh, then the asymmetry that we find that is uh, calculable for us is the case of uh, non-reciprocal media where we put a magnetic field on one of the bodies uh, to, to generate asymmetry. I still would like to know whether uh, for uh, uh, reciprocal media, just having some kind of a uh, uh, ratchet effect would give you a force or not, and that we haven't uh, completely finished figuring out the answer to that. Uh, but uh, once you have the force, you can move things and you have power, and then you have uh, computations of work, uh, Onsager relations, and uh, frictional forces. And with all of these things, you can, in principle, construct uh, an engine. So you need asymmetry that is provided by the uh, non reciprocity, you need heat transfer, and in the short uh, uh, near field regime, short distance near field regime, you have the elements of something that would potentially work. Uh, so this work was done uh, with David Gol uh, Gelbwasser, Noah Graham, and uh, uh, Matthias Kruger, and is continuation of uh, collaboration that has been very useful for the Casimir Force uh, uh, theory at MIT. Uh, former students, Mahrebi, Jamal Rahi, Vlad Gordik, Ramin Golestanian, and uh, people who are uh, in this meeting, uh, Giuseppe Benuate, Ter Torsten Emig, and uh, uh, Bob Jaffe, that uh, has been a long time collaborator, roughly 20 years on this Casimir Force with me. So thank you very much for uh, uh, listening to me. Thank you, Maron. That's That was a terrific talk and a pleasure to hear. Um, we have time for questions now. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any questions in the Q&A on the uh, Zoom screen. Are there any questions coming from the audience? Bob, can uh, Marin tell us a little bit about what the value of alpha could be in some experiments they consider? What, what, what kind of Carnot efficiency can he get? What, what, what alpha can he get? Okay, so maybe for that, I will uh, uh, go back uh, to this there it is, right. explicit calculation that we did for uh, silicon carbide and uh, uh, the thing that uh, we used was a temperature difference that was reasonable uh, between 300 and uh, 270. Uh, the degree of asymmetry, which gave us these very large forces, the distances are uh, again uh, uh, of the order of hundreds of nanometers. So one should be able to go to those distances. 
The thing that I'm not sure how realistic is, is that we assume that we had a magnetic field of the order of 10 Tesla in order to get these results. And that may be uh, too much. And uh, uh, I think in order to get an alpha that is of the order of uh, unity, which is this dimensionless number, I guess for the material parameters that we use for silicon carbide, the, the fields that we had to use were of the order of 10 Tesla. Maron, I can't resist uh, asking you a question, which is a leading question um, to get a little discussion started. Uh, in her talk, Lilia mentioned in passing proposals for vacuum propulsion based on the Casimir effect. Since you've been talking about propulsion in systems in heat baths, uh, I thought I might ask you what you think of vacuum propulsion systems. Okay, Un unfortunately, I was there at the beginning and at the end of Lilia's talk, but I had to go to another meeting uh, in between. So I did not hear the explicit suggestion. Um, so, uh, she just mentioned in passing in a list of interesting ideas associated with Casimir uh, interactions. Yeah. So Lilia, there, maybe you could say more. Yeah, there is the idea about um, using the dynamical Casimir effect, which essentially creates motion and then photons, real photons are created. And because of the non-zero momentum that appears because of the real photon creation, this can be used, the momentum can be used as a propulsion force to some kind of an object. Yeah, um, I mean to, yeah. But I'm not quite sure if that is exactly the same here. It seems like um, maybe it's not a, a dynamical Casimir effect. Um, it's, okay, so, it's more so like of a mechanical, um, you know, engine that that uh, Professor Carter is discussing. Okay, so. Again, just part of the discussion since, so here uh, in this picture, we have two objects mm -hmm. and they are acting as uh, a rocket. They're moving uh, in vacuum in some particular mm -hmm. direction. There is a source of energy, which is the temperature that uh, we have over here. And that source of energy is being converted to motion. Now I can very well imagine that as you mentioned, uh, rather than having a different temperature, I could have something that has uh, motion in it, kinetic mm -hmm. energy. So I can imagine that this is, let's say a rotating sphere and rather than having the other sphere further apart, maybe it is another sphere that envelopes this. So I can imagine that somehow I can convert and this is something that we have calculated that is a rotating uh, uh, sphere even at zero temperature uh, can, uh, uh, emit uh, real photons that uh, will carry away its uh, uh, kinetic energy eventually, and they can potentially then set uh, to rotation some other sphere around. So what uh, I can very well see is that true conversion of energy, either thermal or kinetic, you can cause uh, motion using photons uh, but, uh, and actually they don't even have to be uh, real photons. There could be uh, uh, evanescent waves that that's also possible. Uh, but uh, I guess beyond that, uh, uh, I, I don't know what, uh, uh, whether or not one can tap into existing zero point energy uh, and extract and mine that, I guess we are all kind of skeptical about that. So I just wanna to mention to the discussion, um, a few years ago, people were demonstrating um, like a carbon nanotube oscillator. So finite uh, double wall nanotubes, one is extruded with respect to the other. And then because of the Van der Waals, energy or, or rather force that is uh, different uh, from the edges, then if you keep one tube uh, uh, clamped and the other one you let mo move, it oscillates back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's different than an engine, but it's still a motion that's created because of some kind of um, simple Van der Waals interaction from the edges. And it turns out that this oscillator 
is the fastest mechanical oscillator that people have reported um, with frequency like gigahertz. That's mechanical frequency. It's quite you know unattainable by other um, oscillators that we know. So it's just in addition to what Professor Carter is discussing here for mechanical engine. Quite fascinating. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, is there another question? Yes, uh, Jeremy. Hi, yes, uh, great. Thank, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk. It uh, always gets me thinking about different things. Um, I, I was curious about the, um, the grading like structure that you'd mentioned where you had kind of a single uh, asymmetric grading and talking about heating it up. And I guess you calculated something that's a little bit different, um, didn't see any sort of effect and you have kind of a, a wager out now about whether or not you'd see something if you heated it up. Um, I was wondering, uh, in some of the other calculations you, you talked about, there were two structures and you could get lateral motion in that case. Um, so I was wondering if there's if there's some difference here between having a single object that is heated versus having two objects, and if there's some uh, something in there that uh, causes there to be motion or not motion. No, I I think that the single object was because that would have been the easier thing to compute. Mm -hmm. Right. But in principle, I think from the perspective of symmetry, my question is whether there is a difference between. Uh, transverse forces for reciprocal versus non-reciprocal media. And it shouldn't make any difference except for the magnitude because you can enhance that by near field effects uh, uh, between having one plate or two plates. So there is, uh, in my mind, something that I should be able to, to know whether there is this underlying reciprocity of the electromagnetic uh, field in the absence of, uh, say, a magnetic field uh, has some reason not to generate a transverse force. So if, if it is, it would be somewhat different from uh, the Feynman ratchet, which moves as soon as you have a non-equilibrium uh, setting. Fascinating. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? If not, thank you very much, Maron. Very nice talk. Appreciate it. Um, let's move on to the next talk. Uh, the next speaker is Galina Klimchitskaya, who is a professor at St. Peter the Great University in Petersburg Technical, St. Peter, Peter the Great Technical University in St. Petersburg. Uh, she's also a leading researcher at the Central Ast Astronomical Observatory at Pulkovo of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, Galina is well known for her many contributions to Casimir effect physics, especially in thermal modifications of Casimir forces, and also in the question of looking for new forces at submicron distances uh, that are generated uh, that can be explored by their modification of the Casimir force as a background. Um, she has also worked very closely with many experimental groups on analyzing the results of practical experiments. Uh, finally, she is a co-author of the well-known 2009 monograph on advances in Casimir effects, which from which many of us learned fundamental features of Casimir forces. Uh, Galina is speaking about unusually big thermal effects in the Casimir effect from graphene, both the theory and the implication to the resolution of uh, the Casimir thermal puzzle. Uh, Galina, good to hear from you. Uh, I'm grateful to the organizers for inviting me to present this talk. We will speak about the big thermal effects in the Casimir interaction. Sorry. Oh. Uh, after short introduction, where I would like to remind what is the Casimir puzzle, we consider the main subject, the graphene system, uh, discussing the theory of Casimir interaction in these systems, and then the comparison of theoretical prediction with measurement result. Then we discuss the implication to results obtained for graphene to resolution of the Casimir puzzle for metals and finish with some conclusions. 
The main quantity we will deal with is the Casimir pressure between two planar structures at thermal equilibrium at non-zero and zero temperature. They are given by the famous Lipschitz formula and uh, quantity which we are calculating depend on the reflection coefficients and the planar structures considered. Here, the k perpendicular is the magnitude of the wave uh, of projection of wave vector to the plane of uh, plates. Uh, as was already told uh, uh, today, uh, the approximate expression for the uh, force between the sphere and the plate, the configuration used in experiments, is proportional to this pressure. Uh, all necessary corrections due to deviation from the PFR are sm very small, but uh, are made when comparing theory and experiment. The thermal corrections are defined as the difference between the respectively quantity pressure or uh, force gradient at non-zero temperature, all experiments are performed at room temperature and zero temperature. The thermal regime in the Casimir force is characterized by the thermal length, which is rather large at room temperature. And it was natural to assume that the thermal effects are essential quite near this thermal length. But in 2000, it was predicted first system where exist the large thermal corrections at short separation. This system was very simple, metallic plates. But we know that uh, reflection coefficients for uh, plates made of uh, usual local materials uh, as simple uh, Fresnel reflection coefficients calculated along the imaginary frequency axis. And the main question is what characteristics we are used to describe the dielectric permittivity and magnetic permeability if we have magnetic material. For the metals, we have two. Uh, models of dielectric permittivity. The Drude model permittivity uh, is here. The first term is the contribution from the core electrons, and the second term is the contribution of free charge carriers. And this model is uh, well approved by many experiments with real electromagnetic field. And the plasma model permittivity, uh, which is strictly speaking valid only for electromagnetic, for the interaction of free charge carriers with electromagnetic fields of rather high frequency in the region of infrared optics. However, if we consider the calculation of the force gradient uh, uh, with these dielectric permittivities, in, consider, for instance, the relative thermal correction. We can see that for the Drude model permittivity, there is a lot big thermal corrections at low separation. And this thermal correction is negative. It decreases the value of the force gradient at just near the uh, thermal length thermal correction is rather small, much smaller than, for instance, at separation of three micrometers, where it is about 20%. And if we use the plasma model uh, permittivity, then the behavior of the thermal correction is rather close to the respective behavior for ideal metal. Okay. But if we have the big thermal correction, it should be noted in the experiment. 
But as already told Ricardo Decca, this prediction, this theoretical prediction of big thermal correction for the metallic tense bodies was excluded by the experiments. I show here the picture for the uh, gradient of the force between sphere and the plate from the, for the uh, gold surfaces. And you see here the crosses are the experimental data with their errors. Here the errors calculated at 95 confidence level. The red line here is the theoretic, are the theoretical predictions using the Lifshitz theory combined with the plasma model dielectric permittivity. And blue band is the theoretical predictions uh, calculated using the Lifshitz theory with the Drury dielectric model. Similar situation is for the magnetic nickel test bodies. Uh, in this situation also we have the experimental crosses and the prediction using the plasma model dielectric permittivity are in a very good agreement with the theory and within the experimental errors. And the prediction of the Drude model dielectric permittivity are excluded by the data. The same we have was shown in many other precise measurements of the Casimir force. And moreover, for metals with perfect crystal lattices, the Lifshitz theory combined with the Drude model leads to an unzero value of the Casimir entropy at zero temperature, which depends on the parameters of a system. This means that we have a violation of the third law of thermodynamics, the Nernst heat theory. This situation was called the Casimir puzzle. Okay, so the first prediction of the large, of the peak thermal correction was excluded experimentally. The second system where the big thermal correction was predicted is the graphene, was, which was considered in the talk by Lilia. Uh, what is uh, here uh, the big thermal correction at very short separation distances, even of 10 nanometers, was predicted in 2009. Okay, what is interesting for us? For graphene, the uh, response of this system to electromagnetic field of rather low uh, energy below two EV uh, may be calculated in the framework of the fundamental theory, the quantum electrodynamics at non-zero temperature in one plus two dimensional space time. Uh, this uh, response is described by the polarization tensor of graphene. And reflection coefficients on uh, electromagnetic, electromagnetic field on graphene uh, sheet uh, at real or imaginary frequencies are expressed via the components of the polarization tensor of graphene. And uh, one plus two dimensional space time, the polarization tensor has two independent components. And as these components, it is convenient to use the zero zero component and the trace of the tensor. And uh, each of these quantities may be presented as the sum of the quantity at zero temperature and thermal correction to it. Uh, both uh, polar component polarization tensor at zero temperature and thermal correction depend on the frequency, on the magnitude of projection of uh, wave vector on uh, graphene sheet, on uh, energy gap, which uh, is uh, really existing real graphene sheets, 
and a chemical potential, which is determined by some defects and impurities in the DNA. And surely the thermal correction depends on the temperature. The explicit expression for the polarization tensor, uh, which is uh, which are valid at uh, all plane of complex frequencies, were obtained in 2015 for the zero value of chemical potential, and uh, year later generalized for the non-zero value of chemical potential. It is interesting that instead of the two components of polarization tensor, two independent quantities, we can use uh, two other independent quantities to, characterize, to describe the dielectric response of graphene on, uh, to electromagnetic field. The non-local dielectric permittivities, longitudinal and transverse. And this dielectric permittivity are connected with the components of the polarization tensor. And we can uh, write the reflection coefficients uh, in form uh, via the polarization tensor or via this dielectric permittivity. For pristine graphene with zero energy gap and zero uh, chemical potential, uh, we can see uh, really that there appears a big thermal correction. Here, the black line shows the calculation of pressure normalized to the separation uh, at zero temperature. And a red line shows the calculation of the same pressure between two graphene sheets at room temperature. And we can see that there appears a rather noticeable difference even at separation of 10 nanometers. And what is interesting, the blue line is calculated using the Lifshitz formula at room temperature, but the values of the expression for the polarization tensor at zero temperature. So it does not take into account the temperature dependence of uh, dielectric response of graphene. And we can see that at shortest separation, uh, the main uh, uh, thermal correction is quite due to the thermal dependence of properties of graphene. But at larger separation, uh, both effects give uh, practically one half of total thermal effect. No? Yes, the first prediction of big thermal effect was excluded experimentally. The second prediction also should be checked in experiment. However, it is hard to perform experiments with a single graphene sheet. We should deposit it, this sheet onto some plate. In the case of material plates coated with a graphene sheet, the reflection coefficients depend on the uh, dielectric permittivity of uh, plate material and on the polarization tensor of graphene. And uh, this picture uh, shows us uh, that uh, the influence of graphene on the Casimir pressure between plates increases when the dielectric permittivity of plate material uh, decreases. Okay. As to experiment, the gradient of the Casimir force between a gold-coated sphere and a graphene sheet deposited in a fused silica plate was measured using an atomic force microscope operated in dynamic frequency shift mode. I will not discuss the experimental detail, details. Uh, they will be presented today later in the talk by Omar Muhyiddin. Uh, in the first experiment, uh, it was found that the theory at room temperature is in a good agreement with the measurement data. But 
it was impossible to resolve the thermal effect because for the substrate used in this experiment, the thermal effect was below the experimental error. Sorry. Uh, the second experiment was performed quite recently. Here, the graphene sheet was deposited on rather thick uh, plate of fused silica. And in addition, the parameters of graphene use was uh, determined in independent, in independent experiment. The chemical potential, value of chemical potential, and uh, energy depth. At these pictures, we present the by crosses the measured uh, values of the fourth gradient at different separation ranges with errors calculated at uh, this confidence level. And the uh, red bands are the results of uh, computation, theoretical computations performed uh, for given parameters uh, at room temperature. The blue bands are the uh, results of numerical computation performed at zero temperature. So the difference between the red and blue bands is quite the thermal correction in graphene. And we can see that in this experiment, we really see uh, the existence of big thermal correction in graphene. And uh, we can uh, see the, the difference between uh, predictions at zero temperature at experimental results up to separation about 120 nanometers. So the second prediction of the big thermal effect in at, uh, small separations was experimentally confirmed. Uh, so computation, which have been made using the exact polarization tensor of, of graphene with non-zero energy gap and chemical potential uh, was confirmed experimentally. The same polarization tensor, but along the real frequency axis was used to describe the electrical conductivity and reflectances of graphene. Thus, the spatially non-local dielectric response of graphene found on the basis of first principle of quantum electrodynamics at non-zero temperature is in equally good agreement with the measurement data of the Casimir physics and with the results of optical and electrical measurements performed with graphene. Uh, what is more, it was shown that for graphene, the Casimir entropy calculated using the polarization tensor satisfy the Nernst heat theory. Thus, Unlike the case of metals, there is no Casimir puzzle for graphene. The question arises, what is the main difference between the cases of metallic and graphene sheets? It is beyond doubt that the Drude model describes correctly the electrical and optical properties of metals in real electromagnetic fields on the mass shell. However, for electromagnetic fluctuations, which could be both on and off the mass shell, the use of the phenomenological Drude model might be not enough justified. Keeping in mind that the Casimir force is determined by both on and off the mass shell fluctuations, one may suggest that the Drude model describes incorrectly an electromagnetic response to the fluctuations of the mass shell. Uh, so the main idea is uh, how to find the 
uh, such uh, non-local dialectic primitivities, which are nearly coinciding with the Druda model for photons, uh, for fields on the mass shell, but differ from it for the photons of the mass shell. Hey, what we can consider this? When we uh, are you, uh, going to use the uh, non-local dielectric function, it is uh, very convenient to use the expression for reflection coefficients via so-called surface impedances, determined as shown here. It, under the condition of specular reflection on the boundary surface of material, uh, for spatially dispersive materials, uh, which are described by the longitudinal and transverse uh, dielectric primitivities, depending both on the frequency and wave vector, uh, it, the uh, surface impedances are expressed uh, by these two formulas. These expressions were obtained long ago for non-magnetic media and quite recently for magnetic media. Do the same, surely we can write for the surface impedances along the imaginary frequency axis. So we can, uh, since in three-dimensional case, we, uh, the exact response functions are unavailable, we here consider the phenomenological permittivities in some analogy with graphene, with some additional multiples to the Drude term, uh, which are depend on the frequencies of the order of Fermi uh, velocity uh, from uh, sorry velocities of the order of Fermi velocity for the respective material. For photons on the mass shell, where the inequality holds, uh, the additions are very, very small. So that these non-local permittivities are practically local and coincide with the Druda model dielectric permittivities. And it was shown that the Casimir entropy calculated using these phenomenological permittivities satisfy the Nernst heat theorem, both for metals with perfect crystal lattices and for metals with impurities. As to the experiments, we can compare the results of computations. Uh, the computations were made with the, such parameters and the Fermi velocity uh, was calculated uh, under the assumption about the spherical Fermi surface of uh, material. So first consider the experiment with gold, uh, from gold collated test bodies, which was first experiment considered in our introduction and discussed today by Ricardo Decca. Here once more the Experimental crosses are shown with their errors. The rate band is calculated by the Lipschitz theory using the uh, plasma model dielectric permittivity. Blue band is calculated using the Druda model dielectric permittivity. And black band is calculated using the suggested non-local dielectric permittivities. And we can see that here, this prediction with non-local dielectric permittivities also is in agreement with experimental data to within the experimental errors. And the results of computations are very close to results of computation with the plasma model. The same. Uh, holes also for the magnetic nickel coated test bodies. Here uh, we should use the Fermi velocity for nickel 
and with the velocities depending also with the same multiple as for the goal. And I would like to note that we have made the computation with the equal values of longitudinal and transverse velocities. But really, the result depends essentially on the, on the value of transverse dielectric uh, velocity. And uh, the value of uh, longitudinal velocity uh, may uh, be changed in a range from zero to about 10 values of Fermi velocity without uh, any influence uh, on the results. So here the uh, gray uh, band is calculated using the Drude model and the red uh, band is calculated using the suggested non-local dielectric primitivity. And this picture, I do not show the results for the plasma model because they practically coincide with the results obtained using the suggested non-local dielectric primitivities. So what we can say in conclusions. First, the theoretical predictions of the Lifshitz theory using the Drude model at low frequencies are in contradiction with the measurement data of all precise experiments on measuring the Casimir force and violate the Nernst heat theorem for metals with perfect crystal lattices. This is known as the Casimir puzzle. Second, the theoretical predictions of the Lifshitz theory for the Casimir force from graphene using the polarization tensor bound from the first principles of quantum electrodynamics at non-zero temperature for description of a spatially non-local electromagnetic response is in a very good agreement with the measurement data and satisfy the Nernst heat theory. And last, an experience of graphene suggests that the Drude model may describe incorrectly the response of metals to the electromagnetic fluctuation of the mass shell. The phenomenological non-local responsive functions are proposed, which nearly coincide with the Drude model for the on-shell fields and bring the Lifshitz theory in agreement with all precise experiments and with the next heat theory. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Galina. My video doesn't seem to be coming on. Here we go. So I'm back. Thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Uh, very clear and very intriguing. Um, are there any questions? Uh, while people are thinking about possible questions, let me ask you for a clarification based probably on my ignorance of the use of the terms. Um, is there a distinction? Uh, can you explain a little more the distinction between on and off mass shell uh, photons, does this relate to propagating and evanescent waves, or is there some other distinction? I think so, maybe. We can say that uh, uh, when we uh, uh, write this uh, Lipschitz formula, not along the imaginary, uh, but uh, along the real frequency axis, then we uh, consider the integration independently on two, on the frequency and uh, wave vector, projection of wave vector, and uh, the photons which uh, here we call the on the mal shell, we call the propagating. Yeah. And the photons with uh, here we call the off the mass shell, in this formula we call the evanescent. 
Good. Thank you very much. I, I, actually, I was going to ask what the relation, how you saw this on the imaginary axis, but I think you've made it made it clear that the distinction can be seen in the calculation on the real axis. Um, are there are there other questions? If not, uh, thank you very much, Galina. It was a very nice talk. Uh, we're running a little early. Um, I, I guess I can ask whether uh, Ulf is here and ready to talk. I see you on the screen. Are you uh, happy? Yes. To, uh, are you happy to start a few minutes early? I have no problem with that. So uh, if if you want to, then uh, I can do that. Good. Um, well, let me give you an introduction and then we can go ahead. So Ulf Leonard is a professor of physics at the Weizmann Institute. Um, he is well known for his work on metamaterials and QCD in media. In particular, he's especially associated with the phenomena of invisibility cloaking. Um, he's the author of several books on, on op quantum optics and on cloaking. And today he's going to take on a subject which I have to say is near and dear to my heart, which is the relationship between Casimir physics uh, and cosmological issues. So uh, please go ahead, Ulf, and uh, start your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me try to get to the talk. And oops, get it started. Here we are. Uh, can you see it? Yes, it's fine. Okay, good. So then I will start. So I will talk about Casimir, the Casimir effect and cosmology, and in particular, how it is related to the acceleration of the expansion of the universe and the question of what dark energy is. So I hope to shed some light on dark energy. Now, this is a picture to illustrate the expansion of the universe. And um, what you see there is, it's a cartoon-like picture that shows how over time the universe expanded. So this, shape has to be seen as evolving in time and it has a, a bell shape first and then it bends out again. The bell shape is created by deacceleration. So the expansion, the initial expansion got deaccelerated and then it got accelerated again. And the way we know about this, we knew about this first was from the analysis of supernova explosions and then also uh, the analysis of the cosmic microwave background pointed to the fact that there is an uh, acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And let me first explain why this is something unusual. And, uh, and this requires some basic cosmology. Let me start with the cosmological principle. So that is that on very large scales, order of magnitude 100 megaparsecs, the the universe is approximately homogeneous and isotropic. So instead of having various structures, galaxies, galaxy clusters, what we have is this. So it is just a bland uh, fluid that without any distinction, and uh, it's completely homogeneous and isotropic. Now that makes the analysis simple. In particular, what we could do is we could uh, appoint a Newtonian perspective. So uh, in order to understand how such a mixture of particles would expand, consider the force of a test particle in a uniform mass distribution. So we cut out uh, a sphere and uh, around some center that we, we put and consider a test particle on the surface of the sphere. And now this is a standard exercise, uh, textbook uh, material. That is that uh, the Newtonian force 
of a test particle in a homogeneous sphere is the force of a harmonic oscillator. So it is linear with distance. And so if you would fall through the earth, if you would drill a hole through the earth and you would uh, start falling through it, then you would have an oscillatory motion like a harmonic oscillator. The spring constant of that oscillator is given by Newton's constant times the uh, volume of the unity sphere times the, the mass density. That's the formula. And it carries a minus sign. And that is that if this is an, uh, an attractive force as gravity normally is, and therefore it leads to a deacceleration. So if you picture that the expansion of the universe is essentially traced out by all the uh, constituents of the cosmological mixture, then uh, in fact you get an, you get an expansion, but this expansion has a second derivative that is negative. Now let's have a look what relativity adds to it. And it doesn't add much. So it adds two things. One is that uh, the mass density is replaced by the energy density. So essentially, it's not mass that causes the gravity. It, all energy does. Of course, typically, this energy is dominated by the rest mass, according to Einstein's uh, is equal to E is equal to mc square. And uh, so, <clears throat> The modification is here in the formula that we have the energy density standing. And also, not only does energy uh, produce gravity, also pressure does as well. And since pressure acts in all three directions of space, you get a factor of three in front. So it's the energy density times a plus three times the pressure that uh, gives you the, the force. And typically, the lion's share of this force is, of course, the energy density because it's dominated by the, by the rest mass. But there is a chance that pressure uh, plays a role here, particularly if you have very strong and negative pressure, then that pressure might overwhelm the energy density and you get a change in sign. And let me give you an example where this happens. So this example is a very famous one. This is Einstein's cosmological constant. Here, uh, what you see for on the left, you see Einstein writing down his vacuum field e uh, equation, and on uh, on the right half of the of the screen, you see the Einstein equation in the presence of matter, but also in the presence of the cosmological constant. It's a constant times a unity matrix. Now, what you can do is you can write that on the right hand side of the Einstein equation such that it becomes part of the energy momentum tensor, as if you have an additional contribution to the energy and momentum uh, that is creating uh, gravity. Now, if you have this, then uh, just another piece uh, you need to add, that is that the energy momentum tensor in the cosmic fluid, homogeneous, isotropic, not moving, um, you can understand as a diagonal matrix, with uh, the energy density standing inside and then minus the, the pressure on the other diagonal elements. And so therefore, if you have a constant times a unity matrix, then the pressure necessarily must be negative, uh, the energy density. So it's a very strong negative pressure and that leads to acceleration. So the cosmological constant does the trick. Now, but the cosmological constant is just the phenomenological constant. Where does it come from? And it has been suggested that it comes from vacuum fluctuations. And to my knowledge, the first uh, suggestion, the published suggestion is by Zeldovich, and it's quite some time ago from 1968. And he could indeed show that under some uh, caveats that uh, if you have uh, uh, vacuum fluctuations, they should produce a term that is a constant times a unity matrix in the energy momentum tensor. So there we have it. But if you put in numbers into this term, then you are uh, experiencing a surprise. So the theoretical prediction, if assuming a realistic cutoff near the Planck scale, is off by 120 orders of magnitude in comparison with what the measured uh, result is. So uh, there's quite a disagreement. And therefore, there is need to understand this better. If it is still true that uh, 
Essentially, the cosmological constant and this repulsion, also known as dark energy, uh, comes from vacuum fluctuations, then what we should do is we should try to apply our knowledge of vacuum fluctuations, that is particular the knowledge developed in the Casimir community to this problem. And there we experience, we have quite a lot of knowledge acquired and these forces are nothing, are not so mysterious. So these are, they appear as van der Waals forces uh, between individual uh, molecules, if you have let several of those molecules together to form the electric objects, then they're, and they're just called Casimir forces, but in fact, they are the same. They're occurring in nature. They're the roots for capillary forces that uh, feed water to uh, the leaves of trees. Uh, they appear in nature also um, in the ability of geckos of climbing walls because these feet contain lots of tiny hairs of which uh, they can stick to walls. And so Casimir forces are ubiquitous, and we have quite a good understanding of this, which is evident from this uh, seminar. And uh, we've heard about the high precision experiments that have been performed. And uh, so there is good agreement also with theory and experiment in, in this field. And therefore, we should take advantage of this. And for example, we have uh, manipulations of Casimir forces. That's another thing I wanted to mention. Uh, and the turn to repulsive Casimir forces, to the possibility of having um, repulsive and attractive Casimir forces and to have an equilibrium, these sort of things. And we have a good theory. So we have Lichert's theory that allows a prediction of these forces in realistic materials where there is dispersion and um, uh, <clears throat> uh, and a theory that agrees with experiment up to a percent level. And, so uh, moreover, we can apply this theory to the expansion of the universe because of an analogy. So we could think about the expansion of the universe as an actual expansion. So objects becoming uh, further away from each other, that's illustrated on the, on the left picture here that uh, shows how a patch of space gets expanded over time. But equivalently on the right-hand side, you can visualize this as a refractive index distribution that rises. So the electromagnetic field, that's exactly the same. So in that picture, two points remain at the same positions, but uh, space uh, appears like a medium with a refractive index that changes in time such that optically their distance grows. So these pictures are completely equivalent and uh, therefore we could map the problem of vacuum effects in the expanding universe to the vacuum effects in a dialectic material with time dependent refractive indexing. So all you have to do to go into cosmic cosmology is simply to replace, uh, to turn from space into time. So typically we're talking about uh, forces between dielectric objects that we can describe as dielectric function varying in space, so having different values at different positions, we should then uh, replace this by uh, an arrangement where the dielectric properties vary in time. And, and that's it. The only problem here is that uh, the expansion of the universe is a continuous process. So it, it happens gradually. And we don't have uh, chunks of or jumps happening and as you would have in space. So you have uh, here's a bit of material, there's a bit of material and uh, nothing in between, so to say. And so the dielectric function in space would change uh, discontinuously. And in uh, changes in time, we don't have that. Uh, we have a continuous process and uh, that is the challenge. And that has taken us considerable time to understand. So we began with the analysis of vacuum forces in materials that uh, vary in, in space. And that took two excellent uh, PhD students to, to tackle, a fantastic master student. We benefited from a postdoc who is now an assistant professor at the Weizmann Institute. And I spent then two years in solitude to turn this from space into time. All this work. 
And let me give you three excellent reasons why this all this work uh, is a complete waste of time and then debunk those reasons. So number one, let me uh, give an objection the following. I will prove to you that the vacuum energy is exactly zero. Second, okay, if it's not exactly zero, I will prove to you that it's very small. So it's way too small to be relevant on cosmological scales. And third, uh, even if it, it's not that, uh, if, even if that is not true, then I will show to you that it's not going to be repulsive anyway. So let me go through this, through these three objections. The purpose is to show you how subtle these things are, and also uh, because there's a lot of beautiful physics uh, involved. And number one, so um, that the vacuum energy is exactly zero. The argument goes like this. So imagine we are out there in space. We are talking about uh, the expanding universe. And uh, let's redefine the measure of time. Let's adjust time to the expansion of the universe. You could measure time by using an optical clock. So you have the light pulses bouncing back and forth in a, uh, in a resonator. And mathematically, this means you're introducing a conformal time. So you use the propagation in space as a measure of time. And then naturally, this adjusts itself to the expanding universe. So this means that just introducing this new measure of time, conformal time or operational speaking, adjusting time to the expansion of the universe, this, this takes care of the expansion and uh, light propagates as if it were in Minkowski space. We know very well that in the uniform space, there isn't any Casimir effect and therefore there should be no vacuum force. That's the argument, but you see what we do is this. So we move or, oops, uh, I gave it away already. So uh, we think of moving, let's say, uh, or that the universe is moving and then so we adjust the, the time uh, to it. And you know uh, that this, there is an effect uh, associated. This is not exactly vacuum. And this is the dynamic Cosmic effect. And, which has been measured. And uh, it's interesting to see how the dynamical Casimir effect appears in cosmology. So in the laboratory, there you have, let's say, a resonator, and uh, you change the refractive index periodically uh, between the, the resonator. And um, this is not what the universe is doing. The universe is expanding. Now, look at this picture. So this is a picture of galaxies. And let me expand this like this. Let me do it again and that you, you see it again. And uh, what happens is that, uh, so there is a center in the picture that is not changed, but then um, the objects, the farther away an object is from the center, the more it, it, it is moving out, outside. And this is nothing but Hubble's law. It says that pick any place in the expanding universe and then things appear to move away from this and the velocity with which they move away from is proportional to the distance. And the proportionality constant is the, is the, the Hubble parameter. So uh, that is simply kinematics, but it implies that if you have enough space and in the universe you do have enough space, then eventually you will reach the speed of light. So, and that defines an horizon. It's called the cosmological horizon. And then we know from horizons that they emit radiation. That's the Hawking effect, or in this case, it's the Gibbons Hawking effect. And uh, so, uh, and this is how the dynamical Casimir effect appears here. So its manifestation is the Gibbons Hawking effect. And that means that instead of the, the vacuum, we have thermal radiation uh, with a characteristic temperature and that temperature is given by the Hubble par H bar, the Hubble uh, parameter divided by two pi. Therefore, we are not in Minkowski space and uh, the vacuum energy cannot strictly be zero. Let me show you now that uh, it's approximately zero. So it's very small. And the way to see this is you take that formula and then you put in some numbers in it. So the current Hubble 
uh, con <coughs> constant is such that the universe doubles roughly uh, over the age of the universe. So that's about 10 to the 10 years. And uh, that gives you a very low frequency. And that implies that this temperature is extremely low. So it's in the order of 10 to the minus 29 Kelvin. So it's completely negligible in comparison with the cosmic microwave background. It will not play any role whatsoever, you would think. And it's not entirely true. Why? Uh, well, uh, or maybe another thing you, you would think is that, uh, I mean, what we are doing is we are, we are computing Casimir forces in cosmology. And uh, now Casimir forces, as we know, they are forces occurring on small scales, on the nanoscales or maximally micro scales, uh, illustrated here by the feet of the geckos, that uh, these, the hair on their feet are very, very small. And uh, so if they can play a role in cosmology, the question is, um, what's the difference between these two pictures? So on one hand, we have the world of ordinary dielectrics. On the other hand, we have the expanding universe that we can also view as a dielectric. What's the difference between these two media? And there is one. And uh, the difference is the equivalence principle. The equivalence principle says that all bodies fall at the same rate. Space-time is the same for everything. And in particular, it's the same over the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, not just as shown here, so from the radio wave to the ultraviolet, it's really the entire spectrum from wavelengths ranging from the cosmological horizon down to the Planck scale. And so we have a phenomenal range in frequencies. Therefore, if you have effects that depend on frequency, on your frequency range, on the lack of dispersion, then uh, these effects may become strong in cosmology and they are completely irrelevant in uh, standard day-to-day uh, -day Casimir effect. And in fact, that turns out to be the case. So uh, one can show that uh, this contribution is not small. It becomes cosmologically relevant. And but there's a third objection. Okay, I will prove to you that you're not going to have propulsion. It's very simple. So we know that in order to get, in order to have repulsion, we need negative pressure. So that's uh, this equation that I uh, introduced at the beginning. And, uh, but what we have uh, here they are vacuum fluctuations and vacuum fluctuations are just like any other incoherent radiation. The energy density is given by three times the pressure. So uh, photons or vacuum fluctuations, they're coming from all three uh, directions in, in space and uh, they have a pressure while they're propagating and this pressure then uh, corresponds also to the energy uh, that we have. And uh, so the pressure is one third of the, of the energy density and it is surely positive. So uh, you have no repulsion. And now let me give you an argument why this doesn't matter. And this is another a beautiful argument from simple cosmology and it uses just thermodynamics and uh, energy conservation. So if, the, if we don't have a change in entropy, then we know from thermodynamics that the increase, the increment in energy is minus the pressure times the increment uh, in volume. We can write this in terms of an energy density as uh, volume times increment in energy density plus energy density increment in, in volume. Now, uh, the universe is expanding, the volume is getting larger, and uh, the ratio of increment of the volume over the volume must be then three times the scale factor, in our case, the refractive index, over so the increase in the scale factor over the, uh, the scale factor itself. Taking these things together, what we get is that uh, the increment in energy density is minus three times energy density plus pressure times the increment in the refractive index. And that is known as one of the Friedman equations. So uh, if we then have a situation where the pressure is exactly one third of the energy density, put everything together and see that the increment in energy density over the energy density is minus four times 
the increment in the scale factor or refractive index. That's a differential equation. It has a solution that uh, the energy density must be proportional to the inverse fourth power of uh, the refractive index or the scale factor. And there is here no room for the Casimir force. And that leads to an interesting effect called a, uh, an anomaly. And let me explain uh, how this goes. So why is there no room here for the Casimir force? Because Casimir forces, they live on differences in refractive indices. So differences in refractive indices in space or in time. And uh, so in particular, what one finds from these calculations is that the vacuum energy density is proportional to the third derivative of the inverse uh, Hubble parameter. And so that clearly depends on derivatives of the refractive index and not on the refractive index itself. Now, if we have to consider this Friedman equation, that uh, in particular then the time derivative of the energy density is minus three times the Hubble constant or Hubble parameter times uh, epsilon plus P, then in order to satisfy this equation, so, so to have energy uh, conservation, then we need to add something to the energy. And the something we add to this should be consistent with this equation. So it should not change the right-hand side. And, and therefore, its energy density and its pressure must exactly balance. So energy density of what we're adding here and uh, the, uh, the pressure, they must be negative to each other. So this is how the cosmological constant appears as a trace anomaly. And that... Uh, completes the picture. And uh, this is something that uh, I've uh, written up. And I would like to add one more thing. And that is, uh, we of course then continued working on this in several directions. And uh, I would like to discuss one particular direction. And that is that what we did is to compare the prediction of this theory with actual astronomical data. And uh, so, because astronomy or cosmology has become a precise science, we can, we can do this. And uh, this was done together with a, a beginning PhD student, uh, Robert Rechia. And we recently published our uh, first paper on this. So this is my very first uh, astronomy paper. And uh, this is where we compared the predictions of this Casimir inspired theory with astronomical data. So here is one of these comparisons. So what do you see in this picture? Let me <clears throat> explain this. So this is a diagram called a Hubble diagram and the axes are as follows. So Z is the redshift. So this <clears throat> is a quantity that is easy to measure is simply the frequency or uh, wavelength shift of uh, the <clears throat> event that you are observing and <clears throat> <clears throat> And uh, it depends on the expansion of the universe. So it's the, the redshift created by the expansion. If you have a light wave in your, uh, uh, in, uh, propagating in space and the space is expanding, that is creating a redshift. And so um, uh, if that right light wave was created at some point and you're observing it later, then uh, the expansion from this point to your observation um, characterizes the, the redshift. So this is one one quantity, one axis. On the other axis, this mu is simply the logarithm of distance, loosely speaking. So with some appropriate prefactors and correction factors. So, and, uh, so it's distance versus redshift. Now these dots here, <coughs> they are all, they are supernova explosions. And they are specific supernova explosions, so uh, type 1a supernova explosions, where astronomers know their brightness. You see, if you know the brightness of an object and then you measure the relative brightness, so the, the observed brightness, <coughs> then you can work out the distance from the one over uh, square law in uh, loss of uh, brightness. And therefore you can find this, this mu parameter here. So this is known as a Hubble diagram. And uh, what you see then, there are two curves. One is the red curve and the other one is the black curve. The red curve is the curve from the current uh, best cosmological standard model, assuming a constant cosmological constant. 
and uh, and the black curve, this is our curve. So this is the prediction from the Lipschitz theory in cosmology. And first of all, you see that both curves fit the data very well. And in fact, the Lipschitz curve fits it slightly better. So it's not that statistically significant, but <coughs> it, is, it is, at the very least, it's not inconsistent and it's a bit better than what the prediction is. Moreover, uh, this theory may explain a, a puzzle in astronomy, and let me let me explain what this what this puzzle is, and let me first state what the opportunity for it is. So the prediction from the vacuum fluctuation is that it uh, the cosmological term is created or the vacuum energy because of the expansion of the universe because of changes in the gradual changes in the refractive index and therefore also the effective vacuum energy is in general not fixed but it changes itself and this means that the cosmological constant is no longer constant it is changing and that might explain uh, this puzzle and a puzzle that was perceived as a tension between the physics of the early and the late uh, universe. And uh, it's known as the Hubble tension. And it goes, um, uh, what happened was that uh, the Hubble constant, Hubble constant at present time is the uh, current expansion rate of the universe. One can observe directly and indirectly. So directly from measurements fittingly using the Hubble Space Telescope and, um, and sophisticated uh, distance calibrations using distance ladders. And uh, one can also infer the Hubble constant from the analysis of the cosmic microwave background. And there is a disagreement between the two. That's shown in, uh, in this diagram. So what you see on the left-hand side this is the data or the, the result from the analysis of the cosmic microwave background. And uh, that's what you see on the left-hand side. And what you see on the right-hand side, uh, these are uh, specific direct measurements and they're in conflict with each other. And the distance, the difference is in the order of 10%. And the precision that uh, you get here is if you take several measurements into account, approaches 1%. And so there is a significant tension between these two, and that has been a problem. There has been in the order of 100 theories uh, trying to explain this. And I what we found is that the Lipschitz theory does this naturally. And let me explain how this goes. So first of all, so <clears throat> where does this tension appear because we observe correlations in the microwave uh, background. They tell a lot about the uh, early universe. In particular, they give the information about uh, the constituents of how much mass we have, uh, how much uh, radiation there is, and dark, uh, <clears throat> dark matter versus baryonic matter, and uh, what the value of the cosmological constant should be. And uh, so you have these uh, correlations in the cosmic microwave background, and they're the result of waves. So in the early uh, universe, when the universe was filled with plasma, you had the requirements for, if you like, sound waves, because you had the two crucial ingredients. You had inertia and pressure. The inertia was essentially given by matter, and the pressure by light. And as long as light and matter was coupled to each other, then uh, you would have the for, uh, formation of waves. And these waves then cause correlations in the noise. So this noise was created possibly through uh, inflation. And, uh, and then there it became correlated because of these waves. So essentially what we are doing, we're analyzing the cosmic microwave background and its fluctuations is to look for wavelengths for correlations created by waves. Now, um, now these waves, they are generated about 13.8 uh, billion years ago. And uh, in order to uh, relate their wavelength to an angle in the sky, you need to know the distance. 
and the distance is 45.4 uh, billion uh, years. So it's not the equivalent of uh, uh, well, uh, 45.4 light billion light years away. So it's not the equivalent of uh, 13. Uh, 13.8 uh, billion years, there's a big difference between the two. Why is that? Because of the expansion of the universe. We could visualize this as a time-dependent refractive index. And that meant that at the very beginning, the speed of light was a lot faster because the index was lower, about a thousand times faster than now. So if, you, if, this, if light is propagating faster, than it was now, then that's not a surprise that uh, the distance to the place where for us, the cosmic microwave background was, was generated has been enlarged. And because this depends on the history of how the universe uh, expanded, it then depends on the cosmological constant. So initially the formation of these waves there, uh, the, the cosmological constant didn't play a significant role, but it did uh, during the expansion of the universe. And now if you have, instead of a constant, a time dependent refractive index, uh, uh, you always have a, a time dependent refractive, but the cosmological constant is no longer a constant, then uh, you do get a correction. And it turns out that this correction is exactly explaining what the astronomers have observed. So shown in this curve. So there you see uh, various types of experiments and uh, so observations and fitted along the curve. And this curve is for us, it's a coupling parameter of our theory. And if you choose for this coupling parameter, um, a cutoff that is exactly at the Planck scale, you get this point. And this point is at the same value uh, with 1% precision as the observed, the most precise observed value, which also has 1% uh, uh, precision. So it seems that Lifshitz theory fits exactly what the astronomers have, have seen within the precision of the prediction that we can make. Uh, what we also have analyzed is that uh, what is the Lifshitz theory then telling about the role of vacuum fluctuations for the early universe. So will there be a significant contribution there? If there were a significant contribution, then uh, we should have, we should see a completely different uh, <clears throat> correlations for the, for the cosmic microwave background, not the beautiful spectrum that astronomers uh, have uh, extracted and analyzed. And um, it turns out that the influence is very small. So the influence is in the order of a percent and that's the accuracy of the cosmic uh, parameters. So um, we are not in conflict where, with uh, the physics of the early universe, but you see some interesting differences as well. So what we plan to do in the future is to analyze this further and to see whether there are some subtleties and there are some tensions also in uh, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, whether those tensions can be explained uh, with uh, this theory as well. So what, you, what this plot shows is, um, this is the uh, ratio of uh, the vacuum energy over the total energy. And uh, again, plotted as a function of redshift. And uh, so you're going back into the past, with higher, higher uh, redshift. And you see that for the present, uh, there is a significant contribution of the vacuum. So we are really vacuum dominated. And in the past, uh, that uh, there is a small contribution. What you also see is that the vacuum effects become important at transitional periods. So <clears throat> initially, the universe was dominated by radiation. Then it meant it went over into matter domination, and now it's vacuum dominated. And during the transition periods, there um, the Lifshitz theory predicts that uh, you, get, uh, you get a contribution. So you get some effects created by vacuum fluctuations. Right, so this is what I wanted to tell. And uh, so it seems possible that the physics of Casimir the Casimir effect and the theory that uh, is behind it, it might even shed some light onto a dark subject, dark energy, the cosmological constant, and uh, explaining that 
this is related to physics that we know of in some way that uh, the expansion of the universe, the accelerated expansion, which draws a rather um, depressing picture of the fate of the universe. So it's expanding in, uh, forever into nothingness, that this is just the other side of a force that is necessary for us to exist. And uh, that is behind uh, capillary forces and that is an essential ingredient of life. These two things belong together, uh, which is an interesting philosophical thought that uh, the force that in the end kills the universe is essential for, for life, if this theory is correct. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rolf, that's very nice talk. Very provocative, I must say. Um, are there any questions? Well, let me ask a question. Uh, Bob, yes, I uh, Giuseppe, please. Uh, I will read your papers to understand better the fascinating ideas that you described today. But I have a quick question. Okay. So, mm -hmm. I haven't understood. I mean, using your theory, you say you should be able to say, compute the value of the cosmological constant today. Uh, this is not entirely true. The question is the following. Uh, uh, what yeah. are the three parameters of your theory? Are you okay. able to, exp you didn't write down a simple formula, for example, giving the equivalent cosmological constant today in terms of fundamental constants. What else? I mean, what no. are the parameters in your theory? <laughs> no. So I have, of course, I have omitted all the technicalities and simplified everything. Uh, so this theory cannot predict uh, the value of the cosmological constant. It can predict its change. So the cosmological constant becomes an integration constant. So it is in the initial conditions. And, uh, but it may change. And this change, this is something that this theory can predict. And uh, what we have done, for example, in comparison, in, in comparing um, this theory with astronomic observation, what we have, uh, of course, we have assumed that uh, the initial condition is such that it's consistent with the length scale of the uh, cosmic microwave background because that's a very well measured uh, quantity. And then from this worked out, what is the variation in uh, the Hubble constant at present? which is then predicted by the theory. So you have to put in one more parameter and that's the initial cosmological constant. And then what the theory can do, it can, it can say how it changes over time. So this is- Okay, so you are predicting that it has to change in a definite yeah. manner. Yes. In a definite manner. And what are the three parameters in your model? Are there three parameters or the rate of change is fixed in terms of fundamental constants and something else. So there is the initial constant. Yeah. And, uh, and then the only parameter is, um, uh, is a cutoff. Okay. So if this, this theory works only, assuming that uh, the uh, equivalence principle is broken at some stage. Oh. So if the uh, equivalence principle would hold everywhere. So that is uh, even beyond the Planck scale, then you would get a diverging contribution. But if you, if you have a cutoff and uh, then uh, this cutoff appears as an effective parameter, and this was our, our it's related to uh, the parameter in this curve. So uh, the, uh, we called it alpha lambda. And uh, we can say, well, what if we take the cutoff at precisely the Planck scale, and then this alpha lambda is one over ninth uh, divided by P. And uh, if you choose that parameter, then you get uh, the number for the observed uh, Hubble constant. So there is there is this para this parameter is not well defined because we don't know really what is going on near the Planck scale, mm -hmm. and so that might be a, a, a fluke or a coincidence. And um, 
the thing to do would be to vary, of course, this parameter and to analyze, this is another thing that we want to do in the future, to analyze a lot of these astronomical data. And I've shown you part of it. And then to see um, statistically, what is the best fit? So which of those, uh, which coupling parameter does fit the, the data best? And in particular, when you don't have just two numbers to compare, but when you have a curve, like uh, the ones I showed you uh, with the supernova explosions. So there you do map out a curve. So you need to fit a uh, uh, thousand data points in that case. And what does the prediction say there? And is it better than the standard model? And, uh, and if so, how much? How much can you trust it? How significant is it? These are questions we want to address that will take some work. Okay. Thank you. Let, um, Ulf, let me uh, ask a question that's related to this and pointed. Um, what happened to the 10 to the 120th? They go by randomization. So that's another thing. I, I uh, So given the lack of time, I haven't uh, explained properly. And uh, so the 120 organs of magnitude come in if you assume you don't renormalize. So that there is a cutoff, cutoff at a Planck scale, that uh, where you don't have any infinities. So the infinities that we renormalize away in the Lifshitz theory, that uh, they are they're just large numbers. And uh, because they're a constant, they shouldn't play any role. That's the 120 orders of magnitude. If they were actually present, they would change everything. I, so I we think... would not exist uh, at all uh, in, in that case. I'm afraid that, you, that renormalization doesn't solve all your problems, though, because the condensates that occurred during the evolution of the universe change the effective value of lambda by amounts that are uh, of the order of the condensate scale. So if you've renormalized lambda, so it's zero, the, the vacuum fluctuation piece of lambda, so that it's zero now, just before the QCD chiral symmetry breaking phase transition, which filled the vacuum with a chiral condensate, there would be a contribution to the cosmological constant that is so large that it would change the early stages of uh, element formation and expansion of the universe during the time where we have very good evidence that the universe was expanding again with zero cosmological constant. You can't renormalize it twice. This, this theory, uh, of course not. So this theory assumes that, um, so it's dominant contribution. They come really from close to the Planck scale. So from very short wavelengths. And, and it essentially assumes that at that, uh, at that scale, then uh, all the other effects we would worry about, they are, they are no longer present. So we don't have, uh, we don't need to worry about uh, uh, the non-ability of fields. We don't need to worry, we don't need to worry about mass anymore because uh, this is all small in comparison with, uh, with, the, with the Planck length. Uh, things become simple at this stage. This is the assumption that is made. And, uh, and then um, renormalization is performed simply by, uh, or in a renormalization is performed as we have learned from renormalizing uh, the Casimir effect in uh, continuously varying media. This is the difficult part of the story also. So, and it's something that, uh, that one can test experimentally in, in space. So in time, it's difficult, but what you could have, you have a dielectric uh, index variation in space. And, uh, and that's something we are also working on. So how to test this? So which effects uh, are occurring there? And, um, and then the renormalization depends on the dielectric environment, on changes in the dielectric environment in space and uh, in a specific way. And this procedure was translated from space into, into time. And uh, there we can test it. So there is a, a, a randomization procedure. It's a randomization procedure that uh, takes into account gradual changes in the 
effective refractive index and uh, and it's subtle so that's mm -hmm. uh, this is this is what is done it's, it's extremely interesting thank you very much um i think i think we've run out of time so uh, thanks to Ulf and thanks to the other speakers during the second session